Um, for this, uh, this swag this week, um, just talking about RNG or random number generation, and this is used in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different games. Um, just so many, so many possibilities. Um, there's, there's uh, a lot of different places where it comes up. And that could be something like, um, again, maybe figuring out whether an attack succeeds or fails or how much damage it does, like you have to do on your computer assisted assignment, um, or the value of a reward, like what's in a chest that you happen to open or like what's in a loot drop or whatever. Um, or again, just simulating rolling of numbers of dice. Maybe if you roll a whole bunch of them and drop the lowest or take the average or all sorts of different things. So again, random numbers are all over the place in any kind of game. Um, and it's good to have a distribution that, that follows what you want it to simulate. Um, a really interesting example of this actually is if you've ever played Settlers online, properly the game is played with two dice, so you roll two dice, and six, you know, seven is the most common, and then six and eight are the next most common, and then five and nine are the next most common, etc. And the most extreme and the rarest are two and twelve. But um, when you play with dice, the, the rolls are actually independent, and it's possible that you will get way fewer than the number of sixes you expect, or way more than the number of twelves you expect. And that can be really frustrating if you played based on you know putting your settlements in your cities where there's the most pips, like the most chance of getting things. So when you play online, you can choose to play with non-random rolls, basically. So instead of um, true randomness, which the distribution will probably look something like it should, you can play with non random rolls. So over a number of rolls, there will be exactly the number you expect of sixes, sevens, eights, nines, whatever, of, of everything. But the order in which they come is, uh, is randomized. So it's funny that people think true randomness is not random enough. Um, same thing with like shuffle and, and uh, a bunch of songs being shuffled. Uh, it, true randomness doesn't look like what we think randomness looks like. So yeah, I found that really interesting that you can choose when you play Settlers Online to have it be not random so that it feels more close to what you think random should feel like. Alrighty, so let's let's start into this. It is fairly easy um, to generate random zero one, uh, uniform zero one numbers. Um, one thing you could do is just take the value of the clock, um, like the microseconds on the clock at a particular time. Um, so it is very easy uh, to generate uniform 0, 1 numbers that are equally likely to be anywhere between 0 and 1, but usually games don't use those directly. Usually they'll need to do something more realistic with it. And you want to take that uniform 0, 1 number and do something to it so that it gives you uh, a random number that follows the distribution you want. So I'm going to talk about actually three different methods today. Uh, and well, the first one is actually the one that's mentioned in the course notes. If you know the CDF of the distribution you want, and it's invertible, so it's a one-to-one -one function, in other words, it's either strict, it's got to be strictly increasing, no, no flat parts, um, outside of like before the minimum and after the maximum. Um, if it's invertible, that means that inverse exists, then we can use the inverse transform method, which is what's described in section 8.4. Um, it's also sometimes known as the CDF method or the CDF technique, um, and this is how it works. So you start off, you generate a uniform 0, 1 number. There's a million different ways to do that, but uh, it's something that's equally likely to be between 0 and 1, and you start with that. Second step, we're going to take that number and plug it into the inverse of the CDF. And then the third step is you're done. The x that you've generated, if you do that a whole bunch of times, the x's that you generate will come from a distribution with that CDF. And that's just so cool. It's so simple. If you have a nice invertible CDF, um, then you can do this. And I want to explain why it works. Because this proof is, is also in the notes, I think, but I think it's worth stepping through it because it's pretty cool. So what we're doing basically is taking a uniform random variable. So u is uniform 0, 1. That's continuous uniform 0, 1. And we're letting x equal big F inverse of that value u. And we're going to do the same thing that we always do to do a, a transformation of a random variable. We write the CDF of x in terms of the CDF of u. So let's do that. The probability x is less than or equal to little x is the probability that F inverse of u is less than or equal to little x. Then we take, um, you basically we take uh, F of both sides inside this bracket here. So f of f inverse of u is less than or equal to f of x. And we have to be careful when you take a function of an inequality that it doesn't flip the direction. But big F of x is a non-decreasing function. In fact, here it's a strictly increasing function. And so when we take f of both sides, it doesn't change the direction of the inequality. That inequality is preserved. 
Well, on the left-hand side of that inequality, we have f of f inverse of u, and that's just u. Hey, we got that. Um, since, again, f of f inverse is just the identity function. And then finally, we know that u is a uniform 0, 1 number. And so that means big F sub u, I guess, of anything is equal to that thing. Um, that, that's the really cool thing about a uniform 0, 1 number for uh, 0 less than u less than 1. So if we have this, um, that we know that u is a uniform 0, 1 random variable, that means that the probability of it being less than or equal to something, this thing, is just that thing. So we've shown that the CDF of x, which is what we were calculating here, is just f of x, the CDF that we wanted it to be. So that's the proof. So that's pretty cool. So again, if we have an invertible CDF, then we can take a uniform 0, 1 um, like realization, plug it into the inverse of that CDF, and then what we get out will follow that CDF, f of x. So cool. Uh, so that's again, that's the case that's described in the course notes. Um, second case, what if the CDF is not invertible? So if it has either discontinuities or it's flat for a while, um, what do we do in that case? And the answer is basically kind of the same thing. We just have to be a bit sneaky about how we define the inverse. So we'll just define the inverse as the x-coordinate of the point where the line at a height of u first hits the graph of the CDF. So I'm going to draw a picture because this makes much more sense with a picture. And then the algorithm is exactly the same as before. So here's a picture of a uh, cumulative distribution function. I'll use a different color. Uh, here we go, some blue. So let's say it's you know zero up to here for a while, and then it jumps up to here, and then it's there for a while, and then it jumps up to there for a while, and then it jumps up to here, and then it stays there forever. So this is one here and this is zero, um, and it has these discontinuities. So this function is not invertible. But what we're going to do is imagine that we connect these lines here. So connect that, connect that, and connect that. And we're going to define the inverse of a value u as the point where it first strikes the graph. So I'm going to use yet another color here. Let's go purple. Imagine we have this value here, which is u, the number between zero and one. We're going to go from here, da, 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 aha, we struck the graph, and then so we'll let this value down here be f inverse of little u. Whatever value we pick on the y-axis here, so like if we pick this value right here, then we would go out to here, and then we would drop down to here, and this would be our, our inverse value. So you can see that there's multiple values of u are going to lead to the same values of f inverse of u. So any value between here and here in that whole region is going to lead to this value of the inverse. Um, and that's okay. This is what it would look like if you had a discrete random variable. So again, this is it's not really that much different than, than the previous method, but that's how you would do it if you had a non-invertible CDF, something where there were either discontinuities or flat parts or it's something that's not um, invertible in the calculus sense. You can define it this way, the inverse, and then use the exact same algorithm. So generate a uniform 0, 1, plug that into this made-up function, which is the inverse, uh, and then your result x will come from that distribution with the CDF f of x. All right, last method, which I think is the neatest, is if we have, uh, it's called the PDF t technique or the PDF method rather than the CDF method. And this is where we can use it if we know the uh, PDF of the distribution and it has to have a finite range. Um, so I don't mean, sorry, I don't mean countable range. I mean, it has to be a bounded range. That's what I meant. Um, so apologies for saying countable because it's not, it's not finite. It could be um, uh, bounded. I'm going to fix that before I post it. Bound it on AB. Um, so if we know the probability density function or the probability function, um, we can use this method instead. I'm going to describe it first and then I'm going to demonstrate how it works. So first we generate two random variables, um, one that's uniform on AB and one that's uniform from zero to the maximum possible value that the, uh, the PDF takes on. If we had uh, like a discrete val um, random variable instead, um, you could you could let it equal uh, 
any number between a continuous uniform between a and b plus one and then take the floor of it so chop off the decimal that will get you um, a discrete uniform but in general if we're thinking about a continuous random variable you would use a continuous uniform on a b um, then you're going to figure out what little f the pdf or pf uh, is evaluated at that value you generated and then compare it to the actual value of the PDF at that value. So if the V that you generated is less than or equal to your F of U, you keep the value and let your X equal the, the U that you generated. If it's not though, you discard both values U and V and you start again at the beginning. And you keep doing that as many times as you like and the X's that you keep will come from this distribution. Like this is just the coolest idea. So I'm gonna draw a picture of why this works. So let's imagine that we have, again, a, uh, I'll do, draw it over here. So we have some probability function um, as bounded. So let's say, it, you know, let's say it looks like this. There we go. This is kind of boring, whatever. So that's, uh, that's our distribution. And we're gonna generate, um, so we find the maximum value here of our, of our probability function, and, and we find our, our A and our B. And essentially what we're doing is generating a random point in that rectangle. If this is U and this is V, we're gonna generate a random point in that rectangle. So like, boom, there's one. So then we're gonna say, okay, here's our U and here's our F of U. F of U is down here, sorry. V is up here and F of U is down here. And so that would be step four. V is bigger than F of U, so we discard this point. We just, we ignore that point, we delete it. Um, if we generated another point, say over here, we'd say, hey, look, V, the value that we generated here, is less than F of U, which is up here, so we're gonna keep this value. So that's a good value. And we're gonna just keep doing that. We're gonna like fire darts at this square that's generating pairs of values, U between the minimum and maximum value of the variable, and V between the maximum value of the PDF, uh, between zero and the maximum value of the PDF. And we're basically gonna just ignore all of the points that are above this curve. So I'm trying to erase them gently, quietly. There we go. Just erase all of those values. And what you'll be left with is a bunch of values that come from this distribution, that come from this PDF. So I just think that's such a neat way of, of envisioning generating random variables. You generate pairs of variables, which is like firing a dart at this region, and then you keep it if it's below, underneath that, that PDF curve, and you just get rid of it if it's above that PDF curve. And again, what you the, the collection of values that you keep, you don't keep the, the V values, you don't need them for anything. You just keep the U values, and those that you get generated in this way will come from that distribution. So neat. Alrighty, so um, again, a lot of these make a bit more sense if I actually demonstrate them. So I'm going to open up R here and show you, um, and I'll post this code as well. So the first one, again, I'm going to show you is the CDF technique. This is the one that's fairly um, well described in the course notes. But remember that if we have um, an exponential distribution, its CDF is invertible. So like our, our exponential CDF is big F of X is one minus E to the power of negative X over theta. So we can find the inverse, we can invert that and get that F inverse of U is just negative theta times ln of U. So that's log base E of U. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna set, uh, generate a whole bunch of uniform zero one random variables with the R unif distribution. Um, we're gonna set our parameter theta to whatever we want. I'll set it to 10. And then we're gonna take this to be this inverse function. So negative theta times log of u. And just remember, r uses log to mean log base e, like, like most places would. Um, so we're just plugging this uniform random variable that we've generated into the exponential, um, sorry, into the inverse of the exponential CDF. And then we'll see what we get. So I'm gonna run those three lines of code. This is what the plot looks like of the exponential density. There we go. Um, so again, the, the fact that it's touching down zero here is, is not actually there. It actually just starts up here. There are no negative values, but it tries to imagine that it's a continuous curve. Um, and so there we go. We have this exponential looking curve. And the other way, if we did it with um, plotting the density of the uniform distribution, it looks like this. 
So again, it's not really having any values that are less than zero or bigger than one. Um, R is just trying to like assume that it's a continuous function, um, but the density is, is what we would expect. It's like a nice flat line really near the value here of one. So there we go. We've got our exponential at random variables generated using um, the inverse transform method. Okay, um, what else can we do? We can um, do the uh, idea of a, a discrete distribution which has a non-invertible CDF. And again, I mentioned the easiest way to do that is to just generate a uniform between you know one and seven and then chop off the decimal place. So let's try that. Let's generate 10 random dice rolls and then chop off the decimal with the floor function. Um, and then we'll see what that looks like. This is what it looks like after we have, uh, have 10,000 simulations. So it's not perfect, but we, it's, it's looking pretty close to uniform. And the more we do, the more uh, closer to uniform this graph is going to look. Sorry about that, not being able to see the graph. Um, you can go back, actually. Go back and see the previous plot. That was with uh, 100 die rolls. And this was with 10. We ended up with a really weirdly biased, like lo lo pretty unlucky, lots of lots of ones on this dice. Um, but if we if we the more we do, the closer it gets to a uniform looking distribution. So that's a great way to generate random dice rolls. Um, and then finally, for the um, the PDF technique, and first we're going to generate. Uh, I want to pick a, a randomly chosen um, PDF to work with, and I'm going to just use the distribution where little f of x is 2x. So in other words, that comes from uh, where the CDF is x squared, from x between 0 and 1. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. So again, our, our probability density function is 2x for x between 0 and 1. And this is a bounded um, range, because x must be between 0 and 1. And the, uh, the PDF itself is also bounded. The maximum value happens at x equals 1, and that's a maximum value of 2. So what I'm going to want to do is generate some u's and v's U's are going to be between 0 and 1, because that's the range of uh, the random variable x. And the v's are going to be between 0 and 2, because we want it to go between 0 and the maximum value that the probability density function takes on. So let's do that. We'll run those two lines. Oh, sorry. And we'll plot them, just uh, to see what that looks like. Oh, wow. <laughs> that looks so cool. It's like a fully filled in square, <laughs> basically. Uh, we have this, uh, I'm gonna try and make it approximately to scale here so that the X values and the Y values are proportional. There we go. So it's filled this box here with little uh, points, each of which is one randomly generated U and one randomly generated V. So that was our first step of our algorithm. The second thing we wanna do is um, keep only the ones where um, the value of v is below the value of little f of u for a particular pair. So to do that, I'm going to just start a vector of x's that I'm going to keep um, and a vector of v's that I'm going to keep. I don't need them, but I just want to keep them to show you what it looks like later. And then go through them each one by one. For each value of um, i in 1 to 10,000, if the value of v that was generated at that position is less than the probability density function at the value of u for that particular pair, then we keep it, and otherwise we get rid of it. So if it's between that, we're going to put um, x into our kept x's and v into our kept v's, and otherwise do nothing. So I'm going to just run that loop. There we go. And now we can see what our values look like. So we can plot our x's that we kept and the v's that happen to correspond to it, and we'll see what this looks like. Ta-da! We basically just threw away all of the values that were there at the start, um, that were above that line. So we threw away all of the values of u that were above the, the line, and kept all the values of u that were below the line. And now if we plot the density of x, the x's that we kept, that will follow the density that we want it to look like. So we're going to see that. There we go. There we go. Ha! Isn't that neat? It looks exactly like the probability density function we wanted it to look like. Um, and we can actually also see about how many of them were kept. So it kept 5,008 out of the 10,000 that we generated, which makes about perfect sense, right? We kept about half of them because it's about half of the area. That's not always going to be exactly half. Um, it just depends on what your function is. 
but this uh, just gives you an example of how you can do that. So if you have some probability density function um, or probability function that it maybe the CDF isn't invertible or you just want to do it this way, you generate pairs of values and it's like firing a dart at this, um, this rectangle and then you just only keep the values that are below that little f of x curve. And we do that by getting rid of it if the value of v is above the probability density function of the value for u. And just keep the ones that are below. So there you go. That's how you can generate uh, random variables in three different ways. For the R portion of the computer assisted assignment, should each question have code that can be run independent of the other parts? For example, Q1E1's code leads to Q1E2's code. Um, you don't have to repeat the code. It's one, one TA marks all of part 1E. Um, so if the parts depend on each other, that's okay. They'll be able to see them. So thanks for that question. Um, there was another question as well about rounding. Uh, someone asked, is it okay to leave them in fraction form or do we prefer decimals? Both are fine. Um, it's a little bit easier to check that a decimal is correct. So um, that might be nice to have that just happy TAs mean higher marks, um, but it's totally okay if you leave it as a fraction, um, that's fine as well as, as long as it's correct. Um, so for the machine learning idea of the week, I wanted to talk about setting the threshold for a simple classifier. Um, and we'll start with just a one dimensional problem. So there's basically like only one thing we care about and we have some information about, you know, two different populations. So we have like one that's, you know, a normal curve that looks like this and another one that's a normal curve that looks like this with some amount of overlap. And we, all we get is a random value and we want to decide what do we interpret it as? Do we interpret this as a green or as a blue? That kind of thing. So one only along one dimension. So imagine for this example that we're going to be sending a voltage of either plus one or minus, sorry, plus two or minus two along a connection where plus two represents a bit of one and minus two represents a bit of zero. But the problem is that connection is noisy and it's going to add some voltage to whatever signal is sent. And we'll assume that the amount that it adds is a normal zero one distributed amount. So sometimes it might add very little noise. Sometimes it might add a lot. It might be a positive or negative voltage that it's adding. And so we can, um, we, we're interested in basically interpreting what the signal was meant based on what was received. So whoever gets the message gets an incoming signal of some particular voltage and they have to guess, did this mean a zero or did this mean a one? And they're gonna do that based on a threshold, which we could call C. So we'll set some point here like uh, C, let's say it's like here or whatever. So that if a voltage comes in that's greater than C, we'll interpret it as a one. And if a voltage comes in that's less than C, we'll interpret it as a zero. So the question is, how do we decide what that value C should be? What's the optimal choice of the threshold to use? Because we have to pick some value and that's the cutoff. And we're gonna be wrong, right? It might be, you know, if we, if we got, it might be a one that's bigger than, that, uh, sorry, it might be a zero that actually had a lot of noise added to it and then it'd be wrong. Or it might be a, a, a one that had a lot of negative noise added to it and then that would be wrong. So we have all this possibility of being wrong uh, and we want to sort of try and figure out what, you know, to minimize that probability, I guess. So let's just start with a C of, of 0.5. So essentially, if the voltage is at least 0.5, they interpret the receiving thing as a one. Um, and if it's less than 0.5, then they interpret it as, as a zero. We want to figure out the probability of an error. Um, and it depends on what was sent, of course, right? Like if we sent a one, the probability of error will be different than if we sent a zero. So let's get, do one of the cases first. If a one was sent, uh, then the voltage received will be, we'll call that R, will be two, the, the voltage that was actually sent, plus a normal zero one amount. So two plus Z will be the voltage that's received. And a probability of an error, given that a one was sent, is a probability that the voltage that the person receives is uh, small enough that it gets misinterpreted as a zero. So in other words, that the voltage received is less than this value C that we've set to be 0.5. So we're basically looking for the probability of an error in this case is that R, the voltage received, is less than 0.5. Well, R is two plus Z, so we can sub that in, and then we can move the two over to the other side. So we have the probability that a standard normal, a normal zero one, is less than negative 1.5. Um, remember, of course, a normal distribution uh, if you're using a, a calculator, a normal calculator, that's fine. But if you're using the tables, the tables don't have negative values in them. 
So what you would say is, all right, if we want it to be less than negative 1.5, which is about here, the area underneath the curve here is exactly the same as the area underneath the curve that's above 1.5 by symmetry of the normal distribution. So the probability that is less than negative 1.5 is the same as the probability of being greater than positive 1.5, which is just 1 minus the CDF evaluated at 1.5. So we look that up in the normal tables, and we end up with 6.68% uh, error if we sent a 1. But if we sent a zero, we can do the same calculation. It's just a little bit different. If a zero was sent, then the voltage received will be negative two plus this normal noise. And if we want an error, that means that we accidentally interpret what was sent as a one, which means that the voltage received was greater than 0 0.5. So here we have this same idea, um, sub it in, and we end up with the probability and standard normal is greater than 2.5, which is, um, this is an equal sign, not a minus sign, uh, 0 0.00621, so 0.6% error. Because in this case, we had our classifier C set closer to positive two than to minus two, the probability of error is higher if we sent a one than if we sent a zero. And you can kind of tell that by looking up here at this diagram that I drew. Right? Like the, the parts that are shaded in black are the parts where errors are going to occur. And we can see that by the way we've set C here, closer to the average for having sent a one, it's gonna be more likely to have errors when a one is sent than when a zero is sent. If we wanted to minimize that probability of error overall, how would we wanna choose our, our threshold C? Well, fairly obviously, we would wanna set it to zero, right? If we want, um, if we want the, if we have sort of equal numbers of zeros and ones being sent and we want to minimize the overall probability of error, we would set C equal to zero, exactly halfway between the signals that are sent. And that would give an overall probability of error of um, 0 0.02275. So you should try that calculation yourself, make sure that you can actually verify that. But we might want to use information about, um, about the actual values that are coming in. I, I said that this, you know, if we don't care what was sent and we just want to minimize the overall probability of error and there's equal numbers of zeros and ones coming in, then yeah, we would want to set the threshold to zero. But if we know beforehand that there are going to be more zeros coming in than ones, or if the cost of being wrong in one direction is worse than the cost of being wrong in the other direction, so if, you know, if it's, it's better to underestimate than overestimate or the other way around, we don't necessarily want to, um, want to just set the classifier into the, into the middle. So if we, for example, we knew that we were more likely to receive ones than zeros um, by a factor of two to one, so like two thirds of the time we're getting ones and one third of the time we're getting zeros, we could set C to minimize the overall probability of error, taking that information into account. So if we want the overall probability of error, we can kind of use the law of total probability here. We can think about having, you know, sent a one and get an error or sent a zero and get an error. And then we can use again, that law of total probability to calculate um, the, the probability like this. And again, um, I'm not gonna go through this calculation in a ton of detail. It's basically exactly the same as we did before, but the probability of an error given that we sent a one is one minus big F of two minus C, whatever that, whatever that threshold is. And similarly, the probability of an error given that we sent a zero, that'd be misinterpreting a zero as a one, that is one minus big F of two plus C. Now at this point, we can't really do anything because the, the normal um, CDF is not um, integrable. Like we can't, we can't um, solve it um, uh, analytically. We have to sort of use numerical techniques to solve it. So we can basically, pick different values of C and, and using some kind of numerical method, figure out the optimal C that minimizes the probability of error here is gonna be negative um, 0.17. And again, it should make sense that that value is now closer to zero because we're getting zeros less often. So we don't care as much about the probability of error when a zero is sent as we do when a one is sent. So we end up with an overall error probability of uh, just over 2%. And that's, you know, for this particular problem where we know we're going to get more twice as many ones as zeros. If you knew different information, you could use that um, in your calculation as well. 
So that's kind of neat. That just gives you idea an idea of how we can set the classifier to minimize the probability of error. And it's not always going to be exactly halfway in between if we have some prior information about the likelihood of those different values. The other thing I wanted to talk about, this was all again in one dimension, but this classification problem can exist in two or more dimensions as well. So for this example, I'm going to use a very common uh, idea of like looking at cats versus dogs. Everyone, everyone's one or the other. So if we have a number of weights and heights of a number of different cats and dogs. Um, this is the, the data that I uh, have made this up. Um, and we're, we're sort of pre knowing that some of these points are cats and some of these points are dogs. And I've labeled the cats with an O and the dogs with an X um, because we have this, this is our sort of training set of data. And just to remind everyone, that means that this is a supervised machine learning problem because we know the answers for some of these values. And then we're going to try to use that to predict the values um, or the classification for other animals. So here we have, you know, again, a whole bunch of cats. They're much lighter and they're much shorter than dogs. But occasionally there's a couple of dogs here that are pretty small. Maybe they're like chihuahuas or something. I don't know, small, small dogs. Um, we tend to see again, like, bigger dogs are both heavier and taller, but there's some variation around that. So the question is, if we have a new animal and all we know about it is its weight and height, can we tell whether it's or can we predict with a good deal of accuracy, whether it is a cat or a dog? That's the, the machine learning problem here for this classifier. And there's a huge number of ways to, to do that. So I'm just going to go over a couple of them fairly quickly. We're essentially again looking for a rule that would tell us given only the information of the weight and height of an animal, whether it would fit into the dog category or the cat category. One way to do that is basically just decision boundaries. So you could say, I'm going to draw on this graph here, like, well, anything, any animal that's under um, a weight of, say, eight kilograms uh, definitely has to be, or I guess over eight kilograms is definitely um, a dog, under eight, maybe a cat, maybe a dog. And then also uh, maybe the height here, I'm trying to catch all of there. Ooh, okay, so I caught, I caught one. Yeah, okay, that looks pretty good. So we sort of have these values here and you could say, all right, if, uh, if the weight is over eight kilograms, then it's uh, yes, then it's a dog. If no, then it's, then we don't know for sure. If no, then we have to ask another question. Is the height um, uh, under 30 centimeters, uh, less than 30 centimeters. Um, if yes, then it's a cat. And if no, then it's a dog. So again, that's sometimes called a decision tree where there's basically a question. And then based on that, you have a classification and possibly additional questions. And what that's going to do is do a pretty good job because it'll say any animal that fits into like any of these three quadrants would be classified as a dog. And anything that fits into here would be classified as a cat. Now it's not perfect because it has these two dogs here in mixed in with these cats that it would think are cats. Um, so it's not a perfect algorithm, but it does a pretty good job. So that's one possibility. Uh, I'm going to delete all of this. Because another thing you could do rather than just having like vertical and horizontal lines and looking at each component individually is to use the sort of two dimensional nature of the graph. So you could draw a line like, let's say, this, maybe like that, and anything that's above the line will classify as a dog, anything that's below the line will classify as a cat. So this is the idea of a su support vector machine. And it doesn't actually have to be a linear line. Like it could be, it could be something more like this, you know, like a curvy line like that or something. So like a region where it's probably a cat if it's in that region. Um, but it's, it's probably a dog if it's somewhere else. So again, it could be a straight line, it could be a curved line, could be whatever, could be piecewise linear, anything you like. So having some kind of two dimensional line, that's the, that's the decision boundary. And then anything on one side is classified as a cat, anything on another is classified as a dog. Um, yet another method is uh, called the K nearest neighbors method. So basically what you do is if you have a new animal, so let's say there's a new one like right here, I don't know, there we go. Um, you look at the nearest neighbors to it. So in two dimensions the like, let's say the four nearest neighbors are this cat, this cat, this cat, and this dog. And so out of the four nearest neighbors, three of them are cats. One of them is a dog. The majority is cats. So we would say mm, that's a cat. 
if we had one, say, up here, try to put one here, um, its four nearest neighbors are, I guess, this dog, this dog, this dog, and this cat. So it would say, well, three out of the four are dogs, and this is a dog. Um, but it doesn't have to be four, right? K nearest neighbors, K can be whatever you like. You could do like the five nearest neighbors, or the 10 nearest neighbors, or the two nearest neighbors. You could t change that parameter, and you would get slightly different results, especially for animals near the boundary here, like near the intersection, the overlap between these two sets. Um, so that's the idea for the K nearest neighbors algorithm. There are tons and tons and tons of videos out there and more information about all of these algorithms, but I just wanted to give you a really quick, um, quick example of each of them. Um, and each of them are, have their own advantages and disadvantages. But the idea is always, again, to take this, this data that's multidimensional and try to create rules that will tell you for a new animal or a new object with all of these characteristics, what classification should it fall under. Um, I also have a little math example here if you want to follow through this. Uh, I actually gave you the distributions that were used to generate this uh, set of data. And imagine you had, again, a new animal with 5 kilogram weight and 27 centimeter height. Um, you could find the probability that a cat would be this big and find the probability that a dog would be this small and compare them. And it turns out that in that particular case, it's about five times more likely to be a cat. Um, I'm not going to go through those calculations. You can, uh, you can try that if you like. But that is it for the machine learning idea of the week. Again, this is kind of like a two in one because I did it in one dimensions and also in two dimensions. Um, but this idea of, again, taking this information that's multidimensional and using it to create rules is the, the basic idea of a classifier. And it can be one dimensional, multidimensional, it can be higher than two, uh, but it gets pretty hard to visualize once you get above two dimensions. If a dart lands exactly on the border between 10 points and five points, does it get five points or 10 points? Well, the question is, What's the probability of that happening? What's the probability that a uniform 0, 1, or a uniform whatever random variable, which is continuous, lands on exactly any one point? If we have a continuous random variable, the probability that it lands on exactly any point is 0. So it doesn't actually matter. You can imagine the, the, the border between 5 and 10 is an infinitely thin line and uh, the chance of hitting it exactly is the chance that, you know, spinning a spinner, it lands in, on exactly pi, like two infinitely many decimal places. It's not going to happen. Um, the, that's the weird and interesting and nice thing in some cases about um, continuous random variables is that you don't care about endpoints of regions because the chance of landing on exactly the endpoint of any region is zero anyway. That's why with continuous random variables, we can interchange less than and less than or equal to and less than or greater than or equal to with greater than because there, it doesn't matter. There's no chance of actually equaling exactly any one of those values. Now, of, of course, it's conceivable that in your simulation, really unlikely but theoretically possible that someone generates a combination of X and Y that puts them exactly at the border between two regions, um, that the chance of that is so low, I, I would be astonished if that happened. Like, let's say you randomly generated a, a value of X being exactly 0 0.0000000000, however many decimals R gives you, and at the same time, a value of Y that's exactly one of the um, values that where the where the points change. I can't remember like five five centimeters or whatever. Um, one of the borders uh, again being like five point zero 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 zero. Um, the chance of that happening is microscopic. But if it does, if for some reason you're one of the lucky few, you should go buy a lottery ticket, um, and you end up with a point that you generated that lands exactly on one of the regions. Just pick one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> just pick the higher one. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> If anyone knows the rules of darts, if you land right on the line, does it count as the higher one or does it count as the lower one? But theoretically speaking, it doesn't matter because the chance of landing exactly on the line of infinite thinness is zero anyway. Just remember uh, to submit your assignment by the end of the day today, 11.59 p.m. Um, Eastern Daylight Time. So uh, it might be, depending on where you are, that might be an hour earlier than you're used to, but it is Eastern Daylight Time, all of the deadlines from now until the end of term. Um, so just make sure that you don't get caught up by that. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. I will see you 
um, next live stream and next week um, we've got a few more things going on we've got the next um, collaborative assignment coming up uh, info about that will be posted right after the um, computer assisted assignment is due but it's exactly the same as the first one there's just uh, you make a question share them with your group and then answer each other's questions and then give feedback and make sure everything is uploaded to the right Dropboxes at the right times. And uh, so same as last time, but now you can use all sorts of new techniques. You can use all of the continuous or discrete random variables as possible topics. And there's just a wealth of possibility. Um, so I'm really excited to see what you do with that, with those parameters. All right, bye, have a great day.